We can get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we're all really excited to be talking about this topic and having you here with us. I know that it was uh, a jam-packed day with the BC Tourism and Hospitality Conference uh, workshops also going today. So thank you for choosing to join us. And of course, if you're watching this webinar recording later, uh, we are thrilled that you are spending some time with us and uh, able to connect with us today. Uh, so first I'd like to just uh, acknowledge that today I'm joining from the traditional territory of the Shanaymuk First Nation in Nanaimo and that tourism Vancouver Island, um, we as a whole team gratefully acknowledge that we live and we work and we play on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Kwakwakiwak, Chalmath, and Coast Salish peoples. And so we're really thrilled to be here with you today. And I get the pleasure of introducing our speakers uh, who are a couple of folks that I love working with and have had the pleasure of delivering this presentation with once before. We have fine tuned it, we've added a little bit more there for you, and uh, we're really thrilled to be talking to you today about uh, marine mammal viewing experiences. So the first uh, speaker today is Stephen Gabrish, and Stephen is the president of the North Island Marine Mammal Stewardship Association, NIMSA. Stephen's also the uh, owner of Campbell River Whale Watch. Hello, Stephen. Uh, then we have Jackie Hildering, who is with the Marine Education and Research Society, and she is also the Marine Detective. So if you don't follow Jackie, follow her. Photography is so much fun. Um, and then you have myself, Hannah Grant. I'm the Director of Digital Strategy at Tourism Vancouver Island. So you've got kind of a swath of uh, folks here today to help you out. Natalie is also on the call. Natalie works for Vancouver Island North Tourism and Tourism Vancouver Island. She's gonna be helping us out with housekeeping and Q&A and all that good stuff. So Natalie is around if you need her. In terms of housekeeping, you can add questions throughout the presentation in the Q&A function at any time. Uh, and there will be time at the end of the session for us to take a look at those questions and have some discussion. And before we move over to Jackie's presentation, sorry, Stephen's presentation, uh, I'd like to do a quick poll and just see where everyone is joining from. Uh, so we had interest kind of from all over. Uh, I think we might even have someone from Australia today. I know that it's 6.30 in the morning there. So uh, hopefully having a early morning cup of coffee. Uh, but if you can just throw in the poll where you're joining from, that would be super great for us. Uh, I do wanna emphasize our presentation today is going to focus on the BC context. We're located in British Columbia, Vancouver Island, as many of you know, um, but I do think a lot of the guidance and principles that we're gonna talk about today can apply to other areas as well. So really thrilled to be joining you here today. Looks like we've got quite a few from off island. Wow, a lot from Campbell River, that's awesome. Tofino, Victoria, the North Island and the Comox Valley. Oh, this is great. Lots and lots of votes in here. Thank you. More and other. This is cool. We're going to have to find out later where you came from. Okay. So I'm going to hang on to that poll result and I'm going to stop sharing to pass it over to Stephen. Stephen's almost there, almost unmuted. Might it be possible to see the poll results at some point too? There we go. I think I got myself unmuted finally. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody. It's uh, it's great to see such a uh, such a huge turnout here uh, for this um, topic that's kind of near and dear to our heart. And uh, thanks, Hannah and Tourism Vancouver Island for the opportunity and uh, and for the great introduction there. Um, so yeah, I want to start by letting you know that I'm joining you from uh, Campbell River here on Vancouver Island, and uh, really happy to be living, working, and playing in uh, the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Lake White Oak people, the Clahoose, the Comox First Nation, and also the Hamalco First Nation. So um, tourism for me uh, really is a new industry. I've only going into my fourth season here. So uh, industry that I have a lot of fun in and uh, so great to see how collaborative this, uh, this industry is, um, you know, as evidenced by all the people during the call today and, uh, and by the different groups that came together to, uh, to put this together. Um, so I thought I'd start by uh, just talking a little bit about uh, about NIMSA. 
So the North Island Marine Mammal Stewardship Association. Um, we were founded in 2007. We've currently got 26 members and two nonprofit members. And as you can see by, uh, by the screen there, our members are really diverse. Everything from uh, you know, kayaking tour companies to lodge uh, type activities, daily whale watching companies, uh, overnight excursions, um, small ships, that type of thing. So we've got a really broad, broad range of members. The one thing all of our members do have in common is that we're all actively engaged in uh, marine wildlife viewing in and around the Northern Vancouver Island area. And we try to uh, be really involved in some of the other bigger tourism pictures. So we're active uh, members of the Wilderness Tourism Association of British Columbia and also the World Cetacean Alliance. Um, currently we're run by a working board and we've got uh, one part-time admin person as well. So here's some of the things that we do at NIMSA. Um, the real key is that all of our members are focused on um, our businesses and really the stewardship actions that are aimed at benefiting our, our marine environment, um, the economy, and of course the species within it. Sustainability really is a big focus for all of our members. And uh, we're always trying to figure out ways to strike that positive balance between what we do in our businesses and our human activities um, and how that can uh, minimize the impacts and contribute to the health of the local marine ecosystems. One of the things we're really proud of is our conservation fund. So we have a conservation fund our members donate to every year. And in the spring, we have a grant application process where various nonprofits um, can apply for, for money for different projects that they're going to be doing um, related to marine mammal stewardship somehow in northern Vancouver Island. And in the last uh, three years, we've been able to uh, hand out over $79,000 of grants to uh, 12 different uh, really, really good projects. Um, this year with COVID, uh, you know, things are a little bit tougher on us and the coffers are, are a little bit drained, but we're, uh, we're still going to be running a conservation fund, even though it's, uh, it's uh, 2021 and we're just coming off of this pandemic here. Um, another thing that uh, all of our members really do believe in is our code of conduct. So uh, members sign on to a code of conduct when they become members. It's um, going well beyond the regulatory uh, requirements for both vessel behavior, but also what we're talking about here today, which is the marketing and, and the ethical advertising piece. And we truly think our code of conduct um, leads to the professional uh, professionals out in the water, uh, serving as an example to all the recreational boaters and fishermen on sort of how to how to behave around the around the wildlife. So, ethical advertising. You know what are what are we talking about here? What are we what are we really honing in on? And it's really about how we're, how we're marketing um, our products and our, our businesses and our environment um, and how that ties back to the, the larger ecosystem, the marine wildlife viewing industry and, uh, and really the animals and, uh, and how they fit with, uh, with everything else in the, in the environment. And we're specifically thinking about ethical advertising. Um, the first thing we're always looking at is making sure it's legal and that it's not uh, portraying something that could even be construed as illegal. Um, so videos and pictures of, uh, you know, boats uh, with whales or beside whales and those kinds of things, um, you know, that, that could have gotten there through legal ways or it could have gotten there for, through non-legal ways. And um, what we want to make sure is that all of our advertising, um, that there's no real gray area that you can sort of look at a piece of advertising and say that, you know, yep, that looks like it probably was legal. Um, so so legal is a big, big consideration. Uh, then when we look at the promotional side, um, we want to make sure that we're serving our sustainability goals, that we're promoting the sustainability of the industry and, uh, and the sustainability of um, the environment um, and making sure there's nothing in the advertising that's detracting from that. And all of our members are typically pretty involved in research and conservation. So we're, we're always trying to make sure that our advertising lines up with what we're trying to do on the research, research and conservation side as well. We truly believe ethical advertising is a marketing opportunity. And I'll get a little bit more into that uh, here in the next slide. So we talk about the, you know, why would we want to do this? Why would we want to make sure that we're being ethical with our advertising? Um, it truly is because the, uh, the market is moving that way. The customers are demanding it. You know, we're constantly getting more and more customers coming to us, asking about our carbon footprint, asking about our impacts on the wildlife, uh, which species are doing well, which species are struggling. Um, and, and they really are concerned and they're looking for companies that are, that are doing it the right way and, uh, and trying to minimize impacts. Um, travel trade and media is also really honed in on that. So there's lots of examples out there of travel trade, like Virgin Holidays, you know, moving away from regions with captive cetaceans, and also, uh, you know, examples like TripAdvisor, um, trying not to promote any more um, experiences that have to do with captivity. So, so the market really, truly is, is moving that direction. And the great news about that is 
Um, our region already has some of the highest marine wildlife viewing standards in the world. Um, and that really is both on the regulatory side, we have a lot of really high standards and also on these voluntary codes of conduct um, that I mentioned before. Um, and, and organizations like the World Cetacean Alliance um, actually look to uh, places like NIMSA and Northern Vancouver Island as a model when they're developing their, their world whale watching uh, certification programs and those kind of things. Um, so it is being noticed and we, we already have a great reputation here, uh, which, is, which is excellent. And the other big thing, uh, the other reason why is, you know, just to really make sure that we're accurately representing what, what goes on in this whole area. And that's, um, you know, the fact that we're wild and we're remote and uh, we have a sense of space. Um, we have species diversity here. So um, not just about the orcas, you know, we've got humpback whales and we've got seals and sea lions and birds and um, all these other great species that, uh, that we want to make sure that we're promoting as well. Um, and the other really neat thing about this area is um, this interconnection with conservation and research and, and industry and how uh, industry is always supporting that conservation and research. And uh, anytime we can have that as part of our advertising, we sort of tie that whole big, bigger picture together. And unfortunately, there's some really negative consequences if we, if we don't uh, advertise ethically and, and potentially if the wrong imagery is used. Um, so a real big thing is social license. Our industry is constantly trying to build up that social license and make sure that we're being accepted as a, a viable, sustainable industry um, and, and looking after the wildlife. And by posting things with, uh, you know, vessels or kayaks or anything uh, close, to, close to cetaceans or close to any marine mammal, um, it invites that opportunity uh, for our social license to really be taken away from. And, um, you know, social media is a funny thing. It can really go viral and, uh, and it turns into a tinderbox, right? And we've seen some of that recently with um, the post from Uculet with, uh, you know, a paddleboarder near, near some orcas and, uh, you know, pages and pages and pages of comments and, and a lot of them negative around, you know, don't get close to whales, you're harassing the whales, leave the whales alone, those kinds of comments. And, you know, if a business had posted something like that, I mean, they would have to deal with all that fallout and all that negative comment and uh, it takes a lot of time and energy to, uh, to, to deal with all of that. Um, the other big one is a guide that gets to spend a lot of time on the water in the summer is guest expectations. You know, we're always hoping to have guests come to our boat that uh, is expecting to see whales and, and really wants to see whales maybe for their first time and uh, is not expecting to see, you know, a humpback reaching right beside the boat or something that they saw in an advertising, advertising promotional video or, or photo or something like that. And when we have the guests get on the boat um, with, the, with the right expectations, the really neat thing about that is it, it creates that opportunity for those awe moments, those moments when, you know, they've seen that whale for the first time and they're getting teary-eyed and they're getting excited. And, uh, and that is an educational opportunity. It truly is to talk to those guests about, you know, our ecosystem and our human interconnection with it and how everything that we do on land ultimately impacts the ocean and, and impacts these animals and, and you know, how... How they can thrive and uh, and how our behaviors can really help them. So um, having some guests come on with those kinds of expectations um, really helps open up that uh, that door for that educational moment. Uh, you know, versus a guest that uh, is putting pressure on the guide to get closer and closer to the whales all the time, and now the guide has to get defensive and explain why we can't get closer to the whales. And even though they saw it in the promo, you know, we're not allowed to do that type thing. Um, so. Uh, we want guests leaving the boat um, with their expectations exceeded, uh, not with us, you know, struggling to get to the bar because we sort of advertised uh, false expectations. Um, the other, uh, the other real risk is uh, we want to make sure that there's no business advantage for you know somebody uh, going about it with the wrong behavior, right? So, if uh, a company puts out that post or that video and it goes viral and they get a whole bunch of mileage out of it and a whole bunch of essentially free promotion. Um, that company is going to be incented to do that again, and uh, their competing companies are even going to be incented to uh, try to uh, you know, try to replicate that or, or do the same sort of thing. And it can lead to this one up and chip to try to you know, outdo the competition. And, uh, and that really is a dangerous thing for sure. It's a slippery slope. Uh, destination reputation is another one. So uh, everybody in the tourism space and even uh, you know, ancillary businesses are always building up our reputation in coastal British Columbia. And we have a fantastic one. We just want to make sure that everything we're doing in our advertising is not going to pull away from, from all of those great efforts. Um, you know, the example I always like using for that one is, you know, we're shooting a beautiful hero video in an old growth forest and we've got the bright greens and this beautiful trail and somebody hiking along and then they're carrying a styrofoam takeout container or something like that, right? 
that would be so unnatural to see in that environment. And um, it would really take away from the whole thing. I mean, you would never shoot that as a promotional video and you certainly wouldn't share it. And uh, we like to think of, you know, pictures of marine mammals right beside boats or, or videos with uh, close encounters and those kinds of things. They're, they're much the same thing. You've got this beautiful scene. You've got coastal British Columbia. You've got the colors. You've got a great day. Uh, you've got the animals, which are spectacular. But then the question becomes, you know, how did the boat get so close to that animal and, and what happened there? And, and uh, you know, that really does take away from their reputation versus help build it up. Um, and the other big thing is, you know, it can put the wildlife in danger. And I messaged, mentioned before that the, uh, you know, the commercial boats out there are often, you know, setting the example and setting the tone for, you know, approaching the wildlife and how close you can get and those kinds of things. And um, if recreational boaters and other people out there that aren't as educated on the actual regulations um, have seen a bunch of video of, you know, professional boats really close to, uh, to mammals and those kinds of things, they're maybe going to want to do the same thing. And that's, uh, that ultimately can put the wildlife in danger. And this really is a good segue over to Jackie's presentation because uh, she'll be talking a lot more about the wildlife. So I'll, I'll turn it over to, to her, but I uh, just want to really thank Tourism Vancouver Island for this, uh, this opportunity on behalf of NIMSA. And uh, thanks for everybody listening and uh, look forward to your questions uh, at the end. And switching over. Thank you so much, Hannah and team, for this opportunity and hopefully to be of use to you all. And it's incredibly heartening to see the interest in this topic. I'm going to spend uh, just a minute or two explaining what my background is and what I might have to offer from that background. So I am indeed a humpback whale researcher in the territory of the Kwakwakiwak people on northern Vancouver Island, Port McNeil, center of the universe. But please know that my background is this. Here's some healthy self mockery. I've been involved with ecotourism, so I don't just represent the research part of things. I have been on the boats imitating humpbacks for as long as they've returned to our coast in the large numbers. And before that, it was very much about orca and trying to make the experience of seeing them uh, be of such value that it counteracted the noise footprint and fossil fuels that we were using. Uh, the return of humpbacks gives us a perspective, especially into the human safety element, the boater safety element of what it means to have these giants uh, in, back in our area. And it has made us very much focus on boater education because to date, the likes of Transport Canada have not caught up in relaying what the marine mammal regulations are in boater courses, let alone closing the gap between best practices and boater safety. And that's our Sea of Logo Slow campaign. So British Columbia, 31 species of marine mammal. I'll just list here the ones that are often close to our coast. And of these, eight of them are at risk and protected under Canada Species at Risk Act. Of course, if we have this many giants, it means that the whole ecosystem that they represent is extraordinary in these cold, dark waters. The impacts of boaters not doing not knowing the right thing to do is something I think that you could probably conclude yourself. That ranges everything from not just from noise disturbance, and often there's the perspective that if you're in a non-motorized vessel that there aren't negative impacts. There are, and I'll be speaking to that. There's of course the risk of collision, which has human safety impacts as well. Entanglement is a very big concern and everything from commercial fishing gear to, uh, to recreational fishing gear the ingestion of marine debris from big chunks to the microplastics, water quality reflecting on as well how, that, uh, how fossil fuel use impacts climate change. And then the miseducation when we are those who speak for the wild of British Columbia and how that then can perpetuate pressure on wild animals and I'd go a step further, how it can exacerbate the disconnect from nature and oh boy, do we need more connection to nature. So the marine mammal regulations in Canada changed in, two, they went into effect in July of 2018. So they've been amended. Prior to this time, the national law was, you may not disturb a marine mammal, but there was no definition of disturbance. So you can imagine how cumbersome that would have been, how encumbered that would have been to charge people where if somebody drives close to the head of a whale, 
you then have to have an expert testifying to why that is a problem for that whale. So thankfully, the solidified regulations with definition of disturbance, even though the educational piece of this makes it quite difficult for even the best intentioned boaters to know, the regulations include that you're to stay away 200 meters from Orca on Canada's Pacific coast. There's an exception I'll come back to. It's 200 meters for all other cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, but also calves and whales in resting position, as if the average boater would know that that's happening, and then 100 meters for all other cetaceans. You're probably very well aware of the endangered southern resident orca that are more often near southern Vancouver Island. And because of the plight that they're in, in addition to national law, there are emergency measures. So within that area, there is to be a distance of 400 meters away from, the, from all orca so that there's less risk of increased pressures on the endangered population of orca. I'm not gonna go into huge detail about the distances. All this information can be found at bewhalewise.org. There's also a misconception that it's okay if the whales come to you. And there's a whole ethical dilemma around that as well, because actually the more knowledge you have, you could position yourself where you know that the whales are likely to go. The more privileged you are in learning from the wild, you could then manipulate that to have close encounters. So this of course would be difficult to prove very likely as a violation of the marine mammal regulations or the emergency measures, but it again emphasizes the ethics of this. Further parts of the marine mammal regulations, the national law is, it's also not okay to feed marine mammals. It's not okay to swim with marine mammals. It's not okay to move them. It's not okay to separate them. And it is now, thank goodness, the law that boaters must report when there is collision or entanglement with a marine mammal. Just to show you a very quick video with regards to the swim with piece, because it also emphasizes how things are in evolution. You may be aware that there's an awful lot of imagery online about sea lion and dive with operations in British Columbia. It has, it has skewed the perception of what wild animal behavior is because that what you just saw is not. These are highly habituated stellar sea lions. It is not normal that they are this close in these numbers, nor that they are biting or that you get a chance to pet a sea lion underwater or stick your hand in its mouth. I'll come back to the habituation element and how this can impact both human safety, of course, as well as the welfare for the wildlife. All the regulations and the measures, these are the two sites that are of you see at logoslow.org and bewhalewise.org. With regards to the why behind these regulations and the emergency measures, you're probably well aware sound is magnified in water. Yeah, depending on pressure, on temperature, on depth, but it can be up to five times faster. And marine mammals live in a world of sound. It can, the sound therefore can do everything from masking their ability to communicate with one another, to hear predators, to be able to hear their prey, and generally adds to the stresses, can disrupt rest, and the list goes on and on. But emphasizing again, it's not just noise. There's also disturbance just from the presence of a vessel, even if not motorized. There's an increased risk of collision. There's increased energy expenditure, which adds to all the other stresses and pressures that the marine mammals are undergoing. And of course, these processes are everything again from feeding to mating, to socializing, to mate selection, to resting. And a very new study that's come out has actually confirmed that even when vessels are not, don't have their engines on, that endangered southern resident killer whales will actually give up the chase of salmon, and that it appears that the females are more likely to give up the chase, which of course has impacts with regard to the reproductive success for this population that's already in such trouble. And then this idea of cumulative effects is so important. This is not the only time to stay that these orca yeah, had a boat go by. 
with the stresses associated with that noise and other. So not only is it cumulative effects on the same stress, so noise on top of noise on top of noise, for example, but they also hairball up to combine with things like prey availability and contaminant loads and all the other stresses that the animals are enduring. So it's, a not, it's not a one of situation. And for the endangered Southern residents, for example, there's data that says that there were a hundred per day, a hundred incidents of non-compliance to that endangered population. The habituation piece, and have already, having already showed that bit of video showing stellar sea lions, habituated stellar sea lions interacting with a diver, is that this is of course problematic if the animals are going to lose their wariness, they lose their natural behavior. It puts them at increased risk, with the most extreme example being a very well-known orca for British Columbians, Luna, and how that was a very complicated case, but ultimately Luna was chopped up by the propeller of a boat that it had learned to interact with. But there's also the human safety element with an extreme case being habituated Californian sea lions in Steveston and yeah, fish getting thrown to them, which was then a tourist draw and exacerbated by people getting disconnected from nature and not realizing this isn't wild behavior that a little girl was actually pulled into the water and had to be rescued. The safety elements, no surprise, it's an issue of safety for the marine mammals. Uh, there's no species that doesn't have evidence of scarring, of surviving boat propellers and entanglements. But please know that so often, and this is something I'm slow to realize as, a, as an educator with boaters, is like, why are people not getting how serious this is? That, that not only is it about their safety, certainly with large whales like humpbacks, but why are people not getting how much of a risk this is to marine mammals? And what I finally realized is that I believe people thought that if a lot of animals were dying, they'd see a lot of bodies. But our coast is so beautifully vast for starters, what are the, the chances of finding a dead body and for it to be able to be studied, necropsy, to know what the cause of death is, let alone that people don't understand that dead whales, dead marine mammals, so often sink to the bottom of the ocean so that their cause of death disappears with them. The exception being occasional, like with the case of Hawkeye, this humpback whale had absolutely no signs on the outside of having been hit by a boat. So there was no blood, yet no scarring, and yet there was the evidence that he died of blunt force trauma. And then our research that we conduct together with Fisheries and Oceans Canada is that about 50% of the humpbacks have scarring that shows that they've survived at least one entanglement. How many of them are dead at the bottom of the ocean? So at least it begins to inform how serious the threat is and the need to close the gap in terms of boater education, knowing what to do, and very important with entanglement, knowing what not to do. Humpbacks are a game changer. It's really something on our coast that I think has also helped catalyze the awareness around why there needs to be ethical advertising and how much of an issue it is for boater safety. So humpbacks being back, we get the second chance from them. Their numbers have increased vastly on the inside of Vancouver Island along BC's coast. It's not just population increase post whaling, they're also shifting from somewhere else. But in the absence of these large whales, an awful lot of boaters have gotten used to orca as a default for whale. And orca are big dolphins, they're usually traveling in one direction, they're highly surface active. Enter the humpbacks. The mature females like Maud that you'll see in this video, they're as big as a school bus. They're incredibly acrobatic. They can be absolutely oblivious of fishing gear and of boats. They can be resting right below the surface. So let's let this video speak for itself, how it has certainly shaped what we do as the Marine Education Research Society to try to educate boaters with this game changer back on our coast. So this is around the middle of Vancouver Island, really when the number of humpbacks really began to increase. That's a lot of boats of many different kinds, very close. That's the calf, it's already over eight meters. Here comes Maud. It's a pretty good time to back up your kayak.
And then you know this is going to be good. Yeah, telephoto lens. Oh, look, they're lifting their tails. I'm a naturalist who knows everything. I know they're going to stay down for a really long time. Will they? Or are they super unpredictable? There's Linnea. And here comes Maud. I can hear your screaming all the way from Germany and Australia. Yeah, thank you for being the same people who do not want interactions like this. This went viral, of course it did, with a lot of people going, I want that to happen too. No, you don't. Yeah, please know that baleen whales like humpbacks don't have the biosonar of tooth whales like orca. Sometimes they're very aware of their environment, but certainly when feeding, yeah, they can suddenly, I say this as a researcher who knows them as an individuals, suddenly there's a humpback. They're traveling in these big unpredictable patterns, very often looking for food. And there's this default in many boaters thinking as well, it's like, oh, they're in transit. No, our waters are amazing. It makes sense that they're here. They're feeding in these waters and they're not going in a straight line very often. They in fact are coming back to specific areas on our coast and that you're very often seeing the same humpbacks again and again. I wish humpbacks, speaking for them, not because they're more important, but they certainly pose the greatest threat to boater safety. So I wish they were always unpredictable, that they always didn't know where boats were, because that would be much easier in trying to educate boaters about the need for incredibly heightened awareness. But sometimes they do interact with boats. So here's an example. <laughs> Of, so here's an example of what then puts put forward into the world as being a surprise. Oh. Did you get it? <laughs> so you can imagine how much play this video got in a world of clickbait and therefore the increased need for ethics as well. This is put into the world as fishermen surprised by humpback. Did you get it? And you have your camera out and you start your engine once the boat is closed. Legitimately surprises do happen, but then there's the ethics of promoting this kind of thing. To go back to what I initially had started talking about, there is also this, these interactions where humpbacks sometimes do know very much where boaters are. Two of our colleagues to the north even had their research boat dragged by a humpback that was underneath it. These encounters get referenced as mugging. And yes, again, there can legitimately be surprises. And then there's the ethics that Stephen have, has, of course, already touched on about promoting such things. But also in a case like this, I'm so glad that there's a shifting in awareness amongst whale watchers that when such incidents happen, the mugging, humpbacks choosing because they're not directed at feeding, very likely, they're socializing, they also play with sticks, they play in kelp, that when they choose to interact with a boat like this, could you have avoided it? Because of course we're in evolution in our awareness of whale behavior, certainly a whale that has come back to the inside of Vancouver Island in much bigger numbers. And the conversation is changing to not only the ethics of promoting such things, but there are individual whales that there's a much greater likelihood that they are gonna do this. Seasoned whale watchers most certainly can identify these whales as individuals and read their behavior and how it's probably an idea to stay beyond 200 meters away from them to avoid incidents like this. So the problem with promotion of either what gets framed as a surprise and isn't, or that you find yourself in a situation where it's a legitimate surprise, is that it leads to more surprises, yeah, legitimate or not, or the promotion thereof. It leads, again, as Stephen has said, to people's expectations not being realistic that there is again this push towards up close and personal rather than experiences I think that we want to move towards, which are that it's truly wild behavior and that the highest measure of a good experience is that it happens as if you weren't there. And then of course, the drive to be up close and personal, 
is also an issue for human safety, as well as that for the wildlife and their habituation possibly to boats. And again, with humpbacks as a game changer, there's been everything from kayaks that have been flipped over to the gentleman on the upper left. There's no way he could have avoided the collision with a humpback, having to get reconstructive facial surgery. We don't know what happened to the humpback. And then the gentleman on the upper right is the worst uh, accident that we are at least aware of, since again, it's only been since July of 2018 that entanglement and collision has to be reported legally. But he wasn't driving the boat. A guided fishing vessel went at high speed through an area known to have a lot of humpbacks. A humpback surfaced and he is now a paraplegic. So a summary uh, with maybe a little bit of a different uh, flavor than what Stephen provided is why promote the right thing is basically what it comes down to. There's the business case. There is a decreasing social license to have these close encounters promoted, surprise or not. People want sustainability generally. They want the wild. The market niche, we truly have an incredibly privileged and extraordinary uh, role on British Columbia's coast in speaking for the wild. There's an astonishing diversity of species. The marine mammals are ambassadors, like why are they here? It's because this area is so rich that also First Nations culture has flourished in the way that it has. Our area is extraordinarily beautiful. Yeah, it is an area where we are safe and where there is a sense of space, which is not the case in so many parts of the world, that it is an incredibly important place for research to have happened. It's non-urbanized and the list goes on and on. So defaulting to something else, we don't need to. We're actually devaluing what makes the wildlife experience so unique. And then again, emphasizing, I think we need to help people, the, the people who are come to British Columbia to have the language that goes beyond how many th animals they saw or how close they were. And then legal considerations are of course, uh, the, even if things appear yeah, to have been a surprise, you're perpetuating misinformation that leads to more violations of marine mammal regulations and of the emergency measures. We don't want to put species at risk. And what ultimately is the truth, like looking at where you draw your circle with economics in terms of time, is that what is ecologically sustainable is also going to be economically sustainable in the long term. And then the human safety piece, I think, has been made abundantly clear. Yeah, the risks of wanting to be too close is going to put people at risk, certainly the more that wildlife becomes habituated. And then there is the risk to the animals themselves uh, with regards to collision and other interactions with humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, I had to switch setups. Is the audio okay for a quick test? I think I, I've seen that presentation from you, Jackie, once before, but every single time I get the chills when I see those videos and just a level of horror and concern about what was being shared on social media. And I wanted to put out or kind of draw out one quote that you said during the, the deck, which was that the experience should be like the highest measure of an experience is that it should have happened as if you weren't there. And I think that that's a really beautiful guiding compass for any of us regardless of where we are in the world or what our regulations are, um, that if that's the measure to which we experience our wildlife, then that's probably a pretty good, a pretty good measure. I'm not sure if that's, if you'd agree, if that's, if I'm spot on there or not, but I think that might be a good gu guiding compass for many of us. No, thank you so much because I, I think it is something succinct enough and it changes the dialogue as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen for you now. Okay. I do see questions are coming in through the Q&A, so thank you so much. We will answer those at the end and have a little bit of a discussion. So really appreciate the engagement as we go through and learn from, from our partners. So thank you, Stephen and Jackie, that um, both of those presentations are so incredible and I think really get people started uh, on their own learning journey um, when it comes to ethical advertising and promoting these marine wildlife experiences. So I'm gonna share a few tips about specifically 
how you can portray your experiences or how you can portray um, other experiences that happen on Vancouver Island through your social media, but also kind of what we look like at uh, from the tourism Vancouver Island lens when we are reposting content um, and kind of our own guiding compasses in our in our content uh, curation process. Make sure things are gonna, so yeah, okay. So I know that Stephen, um, in particular, Jackie mentioned it as well, cover the economic benefits of being stewards. But I was doing a little bit more reading last night and I came across a note from Nat Geo about how travelers really are making these monetary choices based on their values. And so I think even more so after the past year, I really wanna recognize um, our operators on Vancouver Island, they are outstanding stewards. They are the people that I learned all of this from. I didn't start in tourism. So I just wanted to really shout out to, I see so many of you on the call today to say thank you for doing the right thing, for being partners with NIMSA or similar organizations for being these stewards. Uh, so thank you to all of our partners in the tourism ecosystem. And then of course, thank you for joining us to keep learning and to push this and continue to uh, really represent Vancouver Island as uh, the destination that we are all so honored to live in. Um, I also found a really interesting study out of Australia. It was mostly talking about kangaroos um, and imagery around uh, travelers holding kangaroos or participating with kangaroos. And it was super interesting. They were from 2001, so early day studies, not, uh, not really days, but not super recent. And even then they're showing that visitors are actually really supportive of restrictions to uh, activities or their access to wildlife if it's supported by an effective interpretation program. So if they're there and they maybe unfortunately had been presented with an image of a kangaroo up close in the wild, but during their experience, they're told that that's actually not okay and they learn and they have to relearn some behavior. A lot of travelers are okay with that. They are really willing to learn and be a part of this. And then of course, through social media and different marketing techniques, we're able to hit them earlier in the funnel and to give them that information before they even make it to our destination so that they feel like they're a part of our community and a part of the way that we operate here. And so it all kind of comes down to that education and interpretation, which we can really start at the social media marketing level, which is really exciting. Okay, so as representatives of uh, the tourism industry, as operators or destination management organizations, it really is on us. The responsibility is to help set expectations with our guests, in particular on the safety of the whole ecosystem. I know when I first started at Tours in Vancouver Island, um, our Instagram account had 1500 followers. It wasn't a very big account. We didn't have a lot of traction. Our Facebook account had quite a bit, but our audiences weren't at these huge levels. And as we grew each month and each year, I felt this huge responsibility to be a steward of the destination, to be a steward of what we have here on Vancouver Island and to properly represent things. And I learned so much from our partners and also from our followers about what they were looking for. And so I really think that we can help set those expectations um, and follow guidelines uh, to support them. Oh, it's skipping ahead on me here. Um, so we can really set, you know, help them realize what kind of experience they'll have and how they can be a part of our community. Um, and so at Tourism Vancouver Island, we actually our images and our videos uh, through those social media channels. So we look to those followers across our platforms and we curate content uh, that they are posting. So that could be travelers, that could be businesses. Uh, this is what we call user generated content. So while we do do photo and video shoots, for the most part, we're looking out into the social media landscape for content to repost. And when we're doing this, when we're evaluating this content, um, I hate to say that we've actually learned the hard way and have made mistakes. And for that reason, we actually have a two-tier system now. So when we're curating content, uh, we use a platform that sources uh, imagery based on hashtags or locations. When we're playing on that platform and we're looking for things to share uh, on social media, we have a two-tier system. Each wildlife photo has to be approved by two different people before it gets posted. This is just a little bit of like a 
it's like an extra set of eyes on things, literally. It's our way of just touching base, seeing if we're comfortable with it as an organization. And sometimes a photo that seems really simple generates a lot of discussion. And so it's really good to be having these discussions as an organization. It helps bring in the rest of the team. Um, sometimes we'll have people who aren't on the social media and marketing team take a look at this content so that they too can contribute and learn and evaluate. And as an organization, it helps us uh, work towards a common goal. The dog is going to start walking around in the background. I apologize if he makes any sounds. This is the joys of working from home these days. Um, so the first requirement that we look at when we're doing this process is, of course, that the regulations are being followed. So we're making sure that the content is within the laws uh, and the regulations of, of our coast. And then we have this, we just, you know, we go with the symbol that we trust the gut. If we're not sure how an image will land, we don't post it. If we can't, as a group in that two-tier system, come to a consensus, it simply doesn't happen. There's, we're really fortunate. We've got um, an incredible amount of photographers and locals and tour operators out on Vancouver Island that are capturing photography and imagery. And so we can, we can choose to not post a photo and look to something else that properly represents and maintains that social license for our accounts. So some of the things that we avoid, we actually rarely show images of a boat and a mammal in the same shot. They're often just far too close. And even if the guidelines are being followed, it's really difficult to gauge that distance. It's so hard to set an expectation uh, in a flat image uh, when you're looking at it on social media and you can't actually see the context of what's happening. And so we really want to set that expectation again that this that seeing wildlife, it's just a joy that is best experienced in the safest way possible for everyone, including those mammals. Um, so this really sets up the standard that close encounters are not normal and not desirable. So as I mentioned, we don't share or post any illegal behavior, not just those approach distances. Um, we actually have a pretty big list that I'll share at the end. Uh, but one one that you might have seen on social quite often is even just feeding wildlife. On Vancouver Island, it's pretty common to see a shot of people feeding a whiskey jack, which is a bird that we have here on the island. Even shots like that, we get tagged with them all the time. We get them sent to us. We simply don't post content that violates those regulations. And then another tip that I have is we love to lean on our experts. I've been so fortunate in my career at TVI to have colleagues um, or board members, our tour operators, who are so willing, like Stephen and Jackie and Andrew, who you might also see his face on this call, to help us learn and to help us, um, you know, learn that a humpback is named Maud and look at her behavior so we can properly ID the species. Uh, we can talk about their behavior in the proper way. We're not making assumptions. We're not sharing incorrect information about what they're up to. And so we really look to these experts um, and for all the tour operators on the call who are these stewards who are already sharing this information, please tag us. We love this. We always want to share uh, as much social media information as we can about our ocean and all of the facts. And I think I don't really need to hit this home. I think Jackie and Stephen really did. But unfortunately, a lot of these illegal behaviors usually end up mostly harming the animals. Uh, we all know the example in BC of a fed bear is a dead bear. And I think we need some sort of rhyme for it here in British Columbia for the rest of our wildlife. Um, but this is just an example that came up recently in January of people are feeding coyotes in a park in Vancouver, and now the coyotes are attacking the joggers. Um, so this has been happening, I think it was just in the news again last week. So this is the sort of thing where the more we can encourage guests and locals to mod, uh, model the behavior that we're illustrating, the better off our wildlife are, and the better our guests are to be having positive experiences while they're here on Vancouver Island. So Jackie and Stephen also covered the notion of surprises and the posts that we often see gain those viral traction are the surprises uh, when the marine mammal surfaces next to a kayak or next to a boat. And as a marketer, we're looking for gold. Like we're always looking for videos that people are going to just be in awe of and be surprised by. Um, but we can find those videos, those incredible moments that meet all of the ethical advertising uh, guidelines that we're looking for. It might mean we have to work a little bit harder, um, but it's gonna be worth it. It's going to maintain all of that social license that we have been working so hard to build. And so, um, I just want to, you know, hit home that we can really find incredible things uh, to share that are safe and that work for everybody. 
Okay, so what do we look for? Um, I wanted to share a really good example. Um, while I say that we rarely show the photo of a boat and a marine mammal in the same shot, I do think that there are examples where this is done really well, uh, where you can see the experience, you get a tone for the image, that it's respectful of the wildlife. So I think that this is a really good example of a photo that we shared uh, from a partner where the viewing distance is really obvious. It's really obvious that they're not disturbing the animals, that this is a really respectful image. Image. So this is what we're looking for. This probably took a lot more effort to capture because you require a second boat to get that shot, to get the distance, to get the tone. Um, but if you would like to tap into our channels and to tap into the way that we do things as a DMO, this is what we're looking for. And we can help you figure that out. Um, we can help you pick photographers that we love to work with who are respectful around this and work in the tourism ecosystem and learn from each other to acquire this type of imagery. But I think this really um, not only showcases the incredible beauty of Vancouver Island and the um, awe moments of these wildlife viewing experiences, but I also love that it's the sea lions because they're one of my favorites to see uh, as someone who didn't grow up on the coast. I still find a lot of joy in the, even the smallest or the most common critters. And so I think that it's a great example too of showing something that isn't necessarily like a star species or something that people might uh, really be focused in on. There's so many incredible little things to see uh, across our coast. So in addition to these marine mammals, we also look to help protect the shorelines of our oceans. We've been really careful over the years about sharing imagery that shows um, tidal pools and sensitive ecosystems. Uh, so we actually, we will share photos of tidal pools, but we make sure that we're always including information about not touching them. If you uh, have sunscreen on your hands, really basically we, we try to take a hands-off approach with a lot of things on our coast and encourage people to look to alternatives. We have really incredible aquariums uh, like the Eucolid Aquarium, for example, where they do have touch tanks. The systems are properly set up where you're washing your hands and you're making sure you're not having uh, too bad of an impact there. So we're really careful about even the, like from the smallest little critters in those tidal pools to those really big school bus humpback whales. Uh, I think Jackie, uh, I can't, did we touch about drone footage? Um, but we can talk about it a little bit more in the discussion too. Uh, drone footage is super important to discuss as a group. So rarely do we share drone footage, uh, even if we're on land, unless we're contracting someone who has all of the necessary licenses. So that's Transport Canada, the research licenses, everything that you would possibly need to be anywhere near these animals uh, with a drone. And Jackie, maybe in the discussion, you can talk a little bit more about drones and marine mammals. Um, but we just, we really stress the importance of figuring out how that footage was acquired and if it met all the guidelines. So when we are curating content um, and having discussions with photographers about the way that it was captured, that's an ongoing discussion. So we were, while we're chatting with photographers, we, we talked to them about how things were acquired, but rarely are we really uh, sharing drone footage for that reason. The next note I wanted to talk about really briefly is just water safety. As a group of DMOs on uh, the island, but also in British Columbia, we follow a set of safety guidelines, uh, which I'll share later. They range from wearing a helmet while you're riding a bike to wearing a life jacket while you're on a vessel in the water. So this is a paddleboard, a canoe, a kayak. And um, I wanna also specifically note, we learned recently too, that it's really important um, per the Transport Canada's boating guidelines to ensure that people in the images are wearing the correct PFD for their age. So depending on, you know, if you've got kids in the boat, if you've got adults, those look different. So it's just really, um, about taking that moment to pause and, and see what's happening in the image and evaluate if it's meeting all the standards. So what can we talk about? There's a lot of things it seems like we don't talk about a lot. There's so much that we can talk about on Vancouver Island and that we can share on our social media channels. Um, and we can really look to um, help our audiences kind of move beyond the idea of how many whales I saw and how close I got to these whales by knowing what makes the experiences in our destination so unique. Um, Jackie mentioned our cold, dark waters. Our ocean is so rich. 
the sheer number of species that we have here because of how cold our, our oceans are, is, it just floors me every time I learn about uh, the diversity of the species that we have here. Clearly, I get very excited about it. I think it's, it's really cool. And so those are the things that we get to talk about. We can talk about the richness of our oceans. We can talk about the beauty of the setting that we have here. And I think we can really talk about safety and the importance of research and conservation to us as a group of islanders. And of course, just the wealth of the Indigenous and First Nations experiences, culture and knowledge that we have here on the island as well. Lastly, we can talk about kind of the privilege of getting out on the water. Um, again, it's less about the, the whales we're putting on a show for us and more about I was on this boat and the sky and the ocean, the waters were so blue and the inlet and the knowledge. We've got so many great conservationists on the island too. And I think that this is where I really look to champion um, our whale watchers and our organizations across the island that are promoting and supporting different conservation and research efforts. So these are things that we can share. These are facts um, and tools that travelers are really interested in. Uh, we can partner with uh, MERS, for example, and talk about what Jackie is learning out on the water and talk about the size of humpbacks and their unpredictable behavior and use that as a way to share our coast, but to further people's education. We can promote, the, like I said, the diversity and the richness of our ecosystem. Definitely take a look at posting different pictures of different species. I know Campbell River, Destination Campbell River was uh, working on a project where they're talking specifically about this. And I'm really excited to see what they're working on in terms of talking about the different species in their area. So I know that we've got the creativity on this call to push the boundaries about the way that we're doing uh, this properly and to get creative about our ethical advertising. And then of course, I think we continue to promote sustainability as a destination. We talk about uh, a lot of our organizations and their uh, dedication and commitment to reducing fossil fuel use, reducing noise, reducing waste and other resources. We've got some really incredible partners uh, on the island for this. So I don't wanna just tell you a whole bunch of things to do and don't. Um, we will also be sharing some text in that resource guide with you that you can include in your social content so that we can all kind of sing from the same uh, song sheet or amplify together. Uh, so I'll definitely share this with you, but these are just little boilerplate lines uh, that we use uh, in partnership with Destination BC and other organizations. And they just help us kind of set the tone about different uh, wildlife that we might see on the coast or different ways that that uh, imagery was acquired. And so one thing that we've really started to do a lot more in the same sort of vein as drone licensing and having that discussion about how a photo was acquired is having that discussion about uh, long lenses and zooms and crops. And so um, we, when we're curating and looking for content, we talk to them, you know, we're, we're it, it's, it's also like, it's framed as a, a friendly conversation. We love this photo. Uh, can you tell us about the lens you use? Can you tell us where you captured this? Were you out with a tour operator? Uh, we're not grilling these, these photographers or these locals or travelers. We're engaging with them and we're talking to them about uh, what their experience was like. And then at that point we can gauge whether or not we're comfortable sharing things and how it's all going. So for those guests who do want a closer look, thankfully we have the technology for that. We have Zoom zoom lenses, we have binoculars that can really give us a closer look without disturbing the animals in their natural environment. Um, so we do share images like this one, where image was taken with a long lens, where it was cropped to focus in on the whales. And when we do share these images, we're communicating to the guests to not get that close, that you need these tools to capture similar imagery. And it's all about setting those expectations. And so you, you can even throw something in a caption like by attaching a photo lens to your camera, you'll be able to get closer to the whale without physically moving. Maximize a wildlife sighting by packing a telephoto lens and be prepared to wait. So it's that other component of this isn't always gonna happen, it may, you may go on a whale watching tour and you may not even see a whale, but you're going to see so much else and you're going to learn from the naturalists and you're going to really 
a sense of connection to the nature that we have here on the coast. Uh, the very first time I came to British Columbia, I got to go out on a boat uh, in the Salish Sea and was forever changed and I didn't see a single whale. So these travelers can have the exact same experience. They can feel this connection and join us in this sort of effort uh, with the help of technology and that interpretive education out of the gate. So here's an example of a post um, that we scheduled, it's probably gone out, um, but I wanted to show kind of an anatomy of what a social media post could look like that's gonna kind of meet some of these uh, guidelines that we've been talking about today. So uh, the first thing is that we noted, this I think was published in the winter time. So we noted that it was taken the previous season so that we're setting expectation that bear viewing is seasonal. It can only be done at certain times of the year. It's not, you're walking down the street and there's Mr. Bear, uh, at least on the island. Uh, so we wanna set the expectation about seasonality and, and traveling there. We also note that this is taken with a local tour operator from the comfort of a boat. So we're positioning it as, oh, look, you can see it from a boat, but they're creating distance. They're creating uh, that sense of safety for Mr. Bear here. Uh, and then we're also at the same token talking about how we do have tour operators that offer these experiences. So a little nod to our tour operators there. If travelers wanna learn more, they can reach out to us about how to book with these tour operators. We jump into some wildlife and bear safety information. So here uh, we can talk a little bit about where they can learn more. We talk about leave no trace principles and we tag Wild Safe BC. So there's lots of resources happening in here. Uh, and then we go into how the photo was taken. So it's that crop and it's the zoom lens. So this is uh, a really simple way that you can stack the content in an Instagram post, for example, and talk about uh, proper social media advertising for the experiences that we have on Vancouver Island. So I know that was kind of a quick run through of a lot of different things. Um, and we've talked a lot about different uh, resources throughout this. So they are compiled onto our website, uh, which I will send out to you. So you don't have to worry about scrambling to write down any links here. Um, we will send it out and follow up there. But our social uh, amplification toolkit goes over all of our safety and responsibility guidelines. And then I wanted to put a couple other partners here that are really important to us. So CoSmart, uh, Adventure Smart BC, Wild Safe BC, of course, of course, you can learn more about Jackie's campaign for Sea Blow Glow So uh, there. We also have a blog about it on our site, Boat Blue, and the NIMSA Code of Conduct, of course, is another great starting point. So we will send out uh, a PDF with resources and a recording to the webinar, as well as a link to the toolkit so that you've got a good system there. Um, and that is me. So we've got, definitely got some questions. Um, and it's looking pretty good. I'm going to pass it over to Natalie to figure out who should answer what. I'll unmute myself, which generally helps. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a question here. Um, Harley, so he's asking, is peer pressure the only way to deal with operators um, embellished advertising? And I do think we touched a little bit on that. Um, but I don't know, Stephen, did you want to? Sure. Yeah, I can, I can talk a little bit about that, uh, Natalie. So thanks for the question, Harley. Um, I mean, peer pressure certainly can be effective. Um, and I think some of the things that, uh, that Hannah certainly illustrated there is that, you know, peer pressure isn't, isn't the only way, you know, the, um, if you'd like your promotion to be picked up by um, a wider audience and some of those kinds of things, um, you know, it's going to have to fall into a certain kind of criteria and, over embellishing and those kinds of things is going to have, I think, less and less uh, organizations want to pick it up. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, uh, you could let people know that the, the actual market is changing and that that type of advertising just isn't going to work anymore in the, in the long run. Um, and, uh, and hopefully that's enough to get those operators. Um, I, I'm certainly seeing that it's, it's less and less operators all the time. So um, as they become more and more in the minority, I think, uh, I think you'll see people get more on board with the, with the ethical advertising piece. But, uh, but peer pressure is still effective, so um, I wouldn't give up on it. If I may, I'll just add a couple of other points. So proving the, the business case, I think the inputs into that are the, that there will be more more court cases as a result of violations of the regulations. 
so that will certainly serve as a significant incentive for doing the right thing. The successes of businesses who profile themselves to be doing the right thing, that, that are following the best possible guidelines and ethics, and a reward of that, for example, is like what Tourism Vancouver Island is doing. Yeah, it's a matter of getting photos shared or not shared, for example. Um, so, so I think those are things that will change and already have, like, I think we're at a really positive time where just from a lot of the feedback that is on social media, when there is an, an interaction promoted that is appears to be too close, it's already showing the business case. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've got a question here from Sam, or maybe more of a comment, but just saying, I'd love to hear a similar conversation to the one currently happening with humpbacks about gray whales. Yeah, and apologies actually, like the, the, what I would have hoped to make really clear is that the humpbacks are like the, the best proxy for the whales because of their size and unpredictability. But indeed the conversation, for example, how we're uh, helping input to be whale wise is to provide the perspective for large whales. We don't speak about humpback specifically, it is about large whales. So thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, okay, one from Danny here. So hello all, this is Danny from Brazil. Different countries have different minimum distances for approach whales and dolphins. How do you see this being shared on social media without um, causing the wrong impression of quote, illegal activity? I'm not sure who wants yeah, to. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can jump in on that one there, Natalie. So um, yeah, thanks for the question and uh, thanks for listening in from Brazil. Uh, that's great. So, uh, I mean, I think it, it first has to start with what's right for the wildlife, um, you know, whether it's legal or not. And, uh, and that's probably the most important thing. So if, you know, if you're posting something that you think may not be right for the wildlife, um, you know, consider it from, from that side first. Um, and then on the legal side, you know, I would say, uh, do your best to, to be educational in all of your social media con you know, commentary and, and make sure that you know, maybe you've written a blog about the local um, rules and regulations and how they're um, how they're enforced and some of those kinds of things. And maybe that's linked in your social media or something like that. So if your followers are educated, then uh, then it may avoid that type of uh, discussion about illegal or not. But uh, but I think the first part about making sure you're focused on the safety of the wildlife first and, uh, and making sure it's beneficial to the wildlife, um, you know, you really won't go wrong if you do it that way. Yeah, and, and another input is that there is increasing research about things like the impact of swim with operations, the proximity of vessels, and even with their engines off. So more and more research is gonna feed into the absence of social license as well for closer encounters swim with and thereby, thereby, for example, you can't swim with humpbacks in BC, but you can go swim with humpbacks in Tonga. That is also gonna start shaping that sort of discussion showing that there are countries that have proven the business case in other ways and that there is research that supports that this is about human need rather than about what is best for the animals. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this properly but uh, mom, mom, um, and Hannah did touch on this quite a bit, but she just says, can you please share the rules or recommendations for aircrafts and drones? So we can maybe, I don't know if Jackie, you want to take that with a little bit more of a marine mammal focus? I do. Uh, I do want to. This is one of the reasons you should follow the Marine Education and Research Society. Things are in flux, folks. So drones is an example of, woo, there goes the technology. Here comes regulation after it. <laughs> so it's, it's, and, and Hannah said it so well, like where there's uncertainty, just don't, <laughs> just don't do it. Yeah, and the regulations, again, amended, gone into effect in July of 2018, they have currently been interpreted to be this. Yeah, you, it, drones are aircraft, therefore, with regard to the marine mammal regulations, you must be above a thousand feet. But then as noted here, by this clever person commenting is like, but wait a minute, isn't it <laughs> illegal to fly drones above 400 feet? 
So effectively, those two pieces of regulation that come together means no drones over marine mammals. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. is in flux, right? And there has to be a stage too, I think, where, where you have the opportunity for educating before you start enforcing. Yeah, and Momo, I can share, we can keep, we can talk about this offline too. Um, I know we've got an email thread going about other things. So, you know, it's just, it, it puts us in such a difficult position when we're working with partners um, and trying to acquire videography when we have to go back and say, we're really sorry, but this isn't, you know, we just can't. It's, even if it's drone footage on land, because we simply don't know how it, it was acquired. Uh, we don't know if it was within like an aerodrome, if it's uh, too close to an airport or not. Um, and just the geography of Vancouver Island makes that particularly difficult. So we're really extra careful with our drone footage, but on the flip side of that, we're really fortunate that we've got the videographer partners on the island that are so excited uh, to help us follow those regulations. I just recommend that anybody that's doing that type of uh, work um, really pauses and does a big reflection about if it's necessary, if it's a needed shot, um, and how to acquire it safely. And, th and there are, of course, which hasn't been touched on, is there are pilot licenses for use of drones. There are applications where, uh, for example, for research as well, for researchers have to offer, have to apply for a research license and where we need to prove and be held to the highest standard of what we do has the potential for conservation that outweighs any sort of potential for disturbance. So some of the drone video that you'll see going into the world has been acquired by researchers, but there as well, as we're in evolution, that has to be made really clear that that has been acquired for the purposes of research and what that research is rather than it feeds the desire for more people to get the same kind of footage. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we've got one here from Amy. Hello from across the border in the San Juan Islands. Regarding sharing social media, including whales and wildlife tours, um, in brackets, especially the southern residents, has tourism Vancouver Island and other operators experienced much pushback from local communities? Uh, I haven't personally seen, um, but we also, I haven't personally seen a huge amount of pushback, but we also are so careful about what we post and the way that we post and we follow those ethical guidelines. Um, we, we don't, I think we, I don't think we've posted the Southern residents in particular mm -hmm. at all. Uh, we would post uh, transients or we'd work with some of our tour operator partners and post other types of content. Um, I'm not, that's not a super satisfying answer, um, but I would just say like, where we do run into difficult conversations or folks who are pushing back, we take that as an opportunity to uh, educate or to educate ourselves as well. And so we really look to our communities for that dialogue. Um, it's really important to us as an organization that our social media accounts aren't just like mystery faces behind these accounts where we're posting things. Um, we are a couple of humans who take it really seriously and who really value our island and that, those discussions. So um, I'm not sure if, you know, Stephen or Jackie, from your perspectives, if you had thoughts on this as well. I don't know if it's valuable to share too that like certainly on Northern Vancouver Island, always been such a focus that research and ecotourism have worked together mm -hmm. and that there's this real desire, like it's it's part of the identity, I think, and Stephen can, can speak to that further, but like of the North Island Marine Mammal Stewardship Association, where there's always been a focus, or always is a strong term, but there is the desire for it to be about the welfare of the animals, and that actually ends up really benefiting the ecotourism business rather than it being all about the ecotourism operators whereby the welfare of the animals may get lost. Yeah, Jackie, I, I would absolutely agree with that, that, um, you know, most operators up and down all of Vancouver Island are, are focused on, on the animals and, and the research and conservation side first. And so, um, you know, all of the promotion just is around that, that subject matter and then by default, uh, the the company you know is getting promoted, and uh, and the region is getting promoted, and 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 the wildlife viewing is getting promoted. Um, but it is always trying to put that stewardship piece first, absolutely. And I think that's probably why for us um, we've been able to to 
work through the system is because with our partners, they're kind of setting that standard baseline and they're the ones that are doing that really incredible work and we're learning from them and amplifying that. So thank you to all of the partners for that. Um, okay, this one kind of fits in with that. So it just says thank you uh, from Sharon. Thank you for all the fantastic presentations. I'm wondering what is being done to make sure as many businesses slash operators are hearing this message. For example, are all NIMSA members, et cetera, being encouraged to attend this meeting and could this involvement become mandatory? Uh, yeah, I, I can certainly handle that. So, I mean, these types of presentations really is, is what is being done um, to get the message out there to a broader, wider audience. Um, and we're really, really focusing on that. Um, it's great that these are being recorded. So um, I know we'll make sure that it's sent out to all of the NIMSA members and they'll, they'll be able to watch it. Um, and uh, by you know, having partners like Tourism Vancouver Island and MERS, um, it's great because we've got a wider reach and uh, we're able to, uh, to work on this messaging together and, uh, and get it out to that wider audience, exactly. Yeah, and from a Tourism Vancouver Island perspective, um, we sent this webinar out to our stakeholder database, which has uh, about 2,500 different people on it. Um, so definitely trying to spread the word out to our businesses on the island uh, as well. Great, thank you. And one from Wilma, are there any plans for requirements for pleasure boat operators and how, to, and how they interact with wildlife? So often we see absolute disregard of any regulations from the whale watching um, vessel. Sorry, my questions are moving, which in turn makes passengers question why we are not following suit, often meaning to get closer. Um, oh, oh, okay. Okay, thanks, Jackie. So, so I'm hoping there's no confusion here that we're just talking about uh, ecotourism operators uh, with regards to the regulations, guidelines, and um, uh, emergency measures. Uh, this is all boaters from paddle, independent paddle border uh, to commercial, uh, commercial operator of any size. Uh, please do check out Sea of Blow Go Slow uh, uh, and note that we haven't gone into the entirety of the marine mammal regulations. Those apply to all boaters. If you have issue with a whale watching company, please report them. Be sure that you're aware of the marine mammal regulations though, but they're not all ecotourism operators, uh, as long as there is no licensing, yeah, or uh, that there isn't the enforcement potential uh, that would be ideal. And before that, the education potential yeah, there's a spectrum. People certainly make mistakes, but if you are sure of your standpoint, because you know the marine mammal regulations and the emergency measures for the Southern resident killer whales, you'll find the number for reporting that at seablogoslow.org. It's not us, it's Fisheries and Oceans Canada. But there are, there's a whole spectrum of operators, again, emphasizing that my background too was on a whale watching boat and that led to becoming a researcher where there are incredibly valuable uh, inputs, especially for the companies who overtly address, we will not get too close. We do not want to put pressure on the animals. There are regulations that we stand behind. We want this experience to be as if you aren't there. We're taking photos to inform uh, research for this particular species. Yeah, and to really take on that role uh, of speaking for the wild and the bigger picture of how these experiences can count. Thank you. Um, so I think that answered another question that we had here. Um, just asking about what the what to do if you do see illegal behavior. So uh, yeah, Jackie. This is, again, be sure that you know that it's illegal. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine what will make the case easy, which is that it's not a static photo, but a video that the boat operator can uh, can be seen like these are the ideals yeah that you can describe well what happened and the importance of reporting like things are simply not at a stage where there can be action for every report there are increased resources made available for enforcement because of the endangered southern resident killer whales but if you are sure that it's a violation and you're calling it in you are helping create data points that there needs to be more education, that there needs to be more enforcement, that there needs to be more legal input, because in the absence of people reporting, it appears that there is no problem. 
Great, thank you. Um, so just let me see. Oh, I've got a question here, and I'm not sure exactly what who they're referring to, but it's can you become a member to be supportive if we're not based in Northern Vancouver Island? So NIMSA question. NIMSA. NIMSA. Yeah, that probably is a, a question for us. So um, our membership criteria really is for uh, for organizations that are based from uh, essentially uh, Salmon Point between Courtney and Campbell River there, um, all the way through the North Island. So so that is our area of focus. Um, and we're looking for members uh, within that area. Um, you know, alternatively, we certainly, uh, you know, invite you to follow our social media feeds and some of those kinds of things um, to stay in tune. Um, but at this time, we're, uh, we're focused on the Northern Vancouver Island area. Thank you. Um, so we've talked about drones. Are there specific rules and regulations for underwater footage? Yeah, you're not allowed to swim with marine mammals. <laughs> yeah, so... So as, as a diver and underwater uh, uh, photographer, it certainly can be that you have a legitimate surprise. So it's the same, it's the same as the above the surface. Uh, things are very much in evolution um, where I know that Fisheries and Oceans Canada is working um, with dive companies to educate and move things along where there are not like put, put divers in uh, beside a haul out where you are going to have this contribute contributing to the habituation. Sometimes there are legitimate surprises and I personally am faced with those ethical dilemmas too, where there's a seal suddenly out of nowhere uh, beside me or in the kelp forest. And I have to weigh out too in how I frame that, uh, that I would say very much like this was a surprise and I take the opportunity to emphasize it is illegal that. Uh, but there are photos where there have been these legitimate surprises where I haven't posted them because I'm afraid that I can't frame it in a way where it benefits the animals. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Um, oh, one more here. We are likely not gonna have time to get through all of the questions. So I'm just gonna go through and See if I can pick a couple that have. I, I see one that I'm going to jump on quickly, and Stephen may want to emphasize as well. Uh, what about when you when there is a legitimate surprise, and in a world of clickbait and Instagram feeds, what do you tell your guests about promoting that experience? Like when there is a whale right beside the boat, and of course that's really difficult. We can't forbid people from posting what they wish to post, but you can take the moment to say uh, exactly what the content of this presentation is, that please consider like this, we did not know this is what's gonna happen. We don't want it to happen. We don't want to provide imagery. So we won't be posting this because we don't want to provide imagery that uh, increases pressure, shapes expectations and whatnot. We would like you to be aware of this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, uh, Stephen, because you have more practical experience if maybe there's something to add to that. Yeah, you know, you're exactly right, Jackie. I mean, that, that does happen. And, and that, you know, that's another type of awe moment that is actually also still an educational opportunity. And, um, and we certainly take, take that opportunity to yeah, go through some of the highlights of this presentation. And, and we try to sort of boil it back to the fact that it's, it's unsafe for the wildlife to be promoting um, this type of content because um, of all of the reasons that we, we talked about earlier. So, um, so that is a conversation that happens. Um, and, and like you said, Jackie, ultimately you can't, uh, can't control what somebody promotes at all, um, but you can certainly try to educate them about uh, why it's a good idea not to, not to promote it, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, maybe one for Hannah here. Um, so how can you convince the regional tourism board to only use ethical footage for their advertising? At the moment, they seem to be going for the wow factor rather than the responsible angle. Oh, I hope that's a, a different regional tourism board. Um, I think, you know, in British Columbia, we're so fortunate. All of us work in a concerted uh a concerted effort to to not go for those wow moments and to really go for following these regulations. 
honestly, it always comes back to that educational piece. Um, I learned from our operators. I learned what these regulations were from the people on this call um, because I'm not from the island and I didn't start in tourism. So when I came into the marketing role, I had a lot of learning and a lot of education. Um, but as someone who moved to the island, I felt this huge sense of responsibility to protect our natural ecosystems as I became a part of, of living here. And so I think that starting those discussions with those tourism uh, boards from a place of education and just uh, really goodwill and generosity and willing to share these resources and share the educational components. And to also have the DMOs recognize that same sort of um, economic benefit that the operators see from ethical advertising, the DMOs receive the same benefit. If we are posting those surprises or the content that doesn't follow these guidelines, we will see commentary on it on social media. We will lose followers. We will have travelers recognize that a destination isn't taking those guidelines seriously. So there is a there's a business case for us as well. It's really important um, to us, you know. Uh, but uh, I think that if you just start with those places, those discussions of education and not from a place of shame, but from a, this is what we really like to work with you on. I think that's where people learn and um, become their own stewards of their destination as well. And I, and I think we're in evolution too, where uh, Tourism Vancouver Island may af actually have uh, standards uh, that the, the equivalent of some of the other smart organizations so we can move in a direction like that, like NIMS already has their code of conduct. Mm -hmm. which, but but as, as there's a, a list and a resource for people to look at, as well as modeling the right thing, we're all moving into a different direction and then also hopefully have resources that can be addressed for, oh, okay, never even thought about that and why we shouldn't do that. Absolutely. And, you know, feel free to share these resources with your local tourism board. Um, we or we invite those discussions as well to share what we've learned. And when I was preparing the research for this presentation, I was Googling a bunch of different things and um, not to toot our own horn, but I found a tour operator on Vancouver Island who had quoted Jackie about these guidelines. And so they had, you know, quoted Jackie, they had quoted MERS. Um, and it's it's really neat to see the whole ecosystem working together. And I think that's something that any destination can take on. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question here. Um, let me see here. So um, wait, does, uh, does NIMSA or MERS collaborate with uh, PWWA? So I believe that is the Pacific, I don't know. Yeah, anyways, down south, so on the on Southern Vancouver. Thank you. Yeah, that's right, Pacific Whale Watching Association. So yeah, I, I should mention that, uh, you know, NIMSA certainly isn't the only association on, on Vancouver Island. There, there are a couple of others. There's also the Pacific Rim Association of Tour Operators as well. And um, yeah, we do actively collaborate uh, where we can. A good example of that was, was last season, um, the entire industry put together just an amazing blueprint for reopening. Um, with the COVID protocols and those kinds of things uh, to get our entire industry on the coast uh, up and going. Um, so there, there is good examples of that type of collaboration and uh, we're certainly interested in, in more collaboration down the road as well with, with the other organizations. And MERS indirectly collaborates uh, by providing marine naturalist courses for anyone who's interested, even though we have to find a way to deal with demand. Um, and also uh, we are not the only humpback researchers on the coast. So uh, our colleagues, uh, we're all collaborating to update, uh, and MERS is the lead on that, update the Provincial Humpback Catalog. So the sightings that come in through the PWWA get fed into that effort as well. Great. Okay, well, we are out of time for today. Um, I think that all of you who registered would have received a confirmation email from me. So you should have my, my email if you would like to follow up. I will also be sending out the recording and some resources that we'll build out for you uh, likely early next week. Uh, I do, I know that we wanted to quickly see the poll results. So uh, that's up there. We've got quite a bit of other uh, for you to see in terms of folks who joined us today. So thank you so much for your time. Um, 
an hour and a half I know is, is very valuable these days, uh, especially on a Friday. So thank you so much for participating. And thank you to Jackie and Stephen and Natalie and Andrew. Um, as Jackie said, I, I also just feel so heartened that everyone is here for this discussion and uh, so willing to learn together. And um, I will uh, very selfishly ask you each to fill out a survey at the end, if you don't mind, uh, just to help us continue to build these uh, educational webinars for everybody. So thank you everybody for joining us today.